Digital marketing seems to be the mystery that most entrepreneurs struggle with, and real estate investors are no exception. The truth is, there are multiple avenues to success. Those experiences will be best shared by the guests on this podcast. My name is Jason Wright, and I would like to welcome you to Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories. What is going on, my friends? Jason Wright here, bringing you episode number 16 of this podcast. As usual, I will have a great guest conversation to share with you shortly. But before we get to that, I've got a question for you. So I've been an entrepreneur on this particular journey seven and a half years. No idea how the time's gone by so quickly, but here we are. I've always been a goal-driven person, right? Set a goal, fight for it, reach it, next one, next one, next one. So... It's interesting. When you think about goals, goals can be checkpoints along the way, or they can be final destinations. It's just a matter of perspective. So recently, I hit some goals of mine that I set a long time ago. I hit two significant goals in the same week. And it was really weird because I always envisioned what it would feel like and what my life would look like once I did that. But the reality is nothing's changed feels the same. So it's kind of a, a letdown, right? It was like, oh man. So I know I need to set new goals, bigger goals and all that stuff to keep moving. But I've realized I've come to embrace that as an entrepreneur, I am a journey guy. I love the climb. I love the chase. I love figuring it out. So it's interesting. I assumed that I was a, a goal guy, meaning once I got there, it's this feeling of great, yeah. Uh, jubilation and excitement, but I actually get that from the journey and not the goal, which is weird. A goal just gives you a litmus test, gives you a checkpoint to see how you're doing versus yourself of, you know, a year or five years or seven and a half years ago. Kind of an interesting thing to think about. So you really need to know what truly motivates you and make sure that you have the ability to keep challenging yourself, whatever that may be. The journey versus the goal, my friend. All right, let me tell you a bit about today's guest. Today's guest is Charlie Wessel, the founder of Cordell Capital. Charlie is also a successful entrepreneur outside of real estate. He's in that Charleston, South Carolina area. Lots of American history there. Currently with Cordell Capital, they've got about 1,000 doors, about $100 million in assets under management. Charlie's a good guy, good conversation. We've had a lot of laughs together, uh, not necessarily are limited to this podcast or this in general is a good guy. So let's check out our conversation and let's see what he can share with us today. What's happening, Chuck? Welcome to the show, man. Hey, how's it going, Jason? Good to see you, buddy. Going well. Great to see you also. So I don't think I know this story about you, but I'd love to hear how you got started down this path with real estate investing. Well, we had some rental houses. That sucks. Um, that always sucks. It's just way more work than you think it's going to be. And uh, I actually got a call one time saying that uh, from a neighbor of a rental house of ours saying that um, he's like, hey, Charlie, there's uh, legs hanging out the front door. I was like, bro, don't call me. Call 911. What am I going to do about it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. So, you know, I had a buddy of mine who was, uh, we. I was a general contractor for many, many years here in Charleston, South Carolina. And um, a buddy of mine had a building for sale for 25 million bucks. It was a big office building sitting right on the Ashley River, had like the four story balconies. I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, we could sit up there and smoke some stuggies and drink some liquor, you know, have an office up there, that'd be pretty tight. I was like, so how do I buy that building? Rent it out. All I need is a small space with the balcony. Yep. And, uh, he said, man, buildings like that are bought by guys like you all the time. He said, you got to get your buddies together, raise some capital, go buy it, contact a commercial leasing agent, and get it all leased up, and then you guys just collect checks. He said, but you don't want to buy that building. It's been in litigation for the past two years. There's not enough, there's not enough parking, and two floors have been totally vacant for a year and a half. He said, man, the easiest and the safest bet for you multifamily housing he said everybody's got to have a place to live it's not everybody has to have an office yep. especially sitting on the Ashley River yep. he said so 
and that's where it all started, man. You know, he was a commercial broker. He said, I don't even sell that kind of property. All I sell is office and warehouse. He said, but if you get some deals, we'll invest with you. So let me ask you, did you, when you heard that from him, you started looking at that, did you stop doing single family? Was there a point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore? Yeah, absolutely. Like right, I, before I even talked to him. Yep. I didn't want to do that anymore. It, it's Pain in the ass. Yeah, I, I can understand. Uh, it's interesting. I talked to a lot of people in this show and, um, you know, and even in the main business that we're in, we talk to people like you every day, but most people, I would say that starting a single family don't stay there. I did talk to a guy the other day that was still doing it at a really high level and commercial real estate with multifamily, which was interesting. But most people, it sounds like get out of it because of the crazy stories, like you said. Yeah. And listen, you can do it if you have a huge company. Yeah. So he's got a lot of people on his team. I yep. don't want a lot of people on my team. Yeah. So that's how he does residential. I'm curious, what were the legs? Was that like a deceased person or what was the story with the legs? No, she was drunk and passed out <laughs> at like 10 in the morning. I mean, why not be drunk and passed out at 10 in the morning? Yeah, that's not normal. Not normal at all. No, nah, huh? <laughs> nah, we play golf. We start drinking about 1030, but that's, <laughs> that's just playing golf. All right. So with your business now, uh, what asset classes and or markets do you focus on and why? Right now, we have previously focused on uh, multifamily. We have close to a thousand doors in multifamily, uh, just over a hundred million dollars in multifamily assets under management. We just recently sold one that we had for four years and dropped like a 26.3% average annual return back to our investors. We got another one that'll sell, supposed to sell by March 23rd is like this is, they pushed it out three times closing. But um, that one should be a lot higher than that of a return in two years. Um, and everybody's like, oh, you can't sell a deal right now. You know, interest rates are too high, this, that, and the other. And, you know, no, I mean, we're selling one. They probably got 7 or 8% on it, you know? Yep. I don't know what they have on it. Um, but I don't really care as long as, they, as long as it sells. It's 66 units in Greensboro, North Carolina. So do you stick kind of in the market close to you geographically or is there, is there a, plan, a strategy with that at all? No, not at all. Matter of fact, the hardest uh, raise I've had um, as a private equity firm, because that's what we did. We jumped from, you know, we went from single contractor, single family contractor together. Yep. To, uh, then we did multifamily. We chased deals around for two years. It was a complete pain in the behind. All we, you know, dealing with brokers, I mean, these guys, God bless them. They're all 25 year old entitled kids with way too much gel in their hair, man. And uh, I just can't, I can't deal with them, but God bless them, anyways. So, you know, so when we couldn't get into a deal, we want, we made best and final in a handful of deals. And then, uh, you know, we got awarded one that fell apart in due diligence, polypropylene piping throughout the thing. That was an extra $400,000 repair that we weren't anticipating. Yeah. Um, so, you know, lost about 10 grand there. I was like, man, I'm done with this. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to get a raise capital, bring it to some guys that I know are executing deals. Yeah. And they have a hell of a track record. Yeah. Let's go. So that's when we started the private equity firm, Cordell Capital. Yep. And uh, yeah, I don't know where we were going with that, but that, that's, I just kind of wanted to look, fill in that backstory a little yeah. bit on that. But. No, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> and I know you, like I've met you, I've hung out with you. So for people watching or listening, um, they may not have picked up on that. So uh, I know you're a real conversational dude. You're a great networker of people. When you think about the simple marketing strategies that have worked for you so far, as far as bringing new investors into your world, what's worked for you? Um, well, we've done, uh, God bless you, buddy. We've done some um, direct messaging campaigns through uh, LinkedIn, and that's mm -hmm. worked. That's brought in, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of book calls through that and a handful of investors. Uh, we just started your program, you know, the intentionally inspirational program with our uh, our email marketing drip campaigns through Active Campaign 
and yep. we will see how that all turns out. I'm sure it'll be great. I mean, we've done email campaigns before, and they were horrible. Yeah, they still had, <laughs> you know, they still had pretty good results. So, uh, sharpening the pencil with yours is should really help out a lot. Yeah. Um. You know, I find that it, a lot we're. We do. We post on social media every day, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, blah blah blah. YouTube. We don't do YouTube every day, but um, I have a lot of people come up to me and they're like, "Hey, I saw. I, I keep seeing you all the time on Facebook." I'm like, "Really? How about give me a thumbs up on that thing, or you know, <laughs> share it or something?" I said, "Because yeah. I know you have never done it because I see it." Yeah, and um. You're like, yeah, 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 I will. You know, so anyways, I mean, just getting out there, man. You just got to get out there. Yep. You know, it's it's a pain in the butt. It's not, it is who I am and it's not who I am all at the same time. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing with social media is more personal stuff than uh, than business. My business, you know, our business stuff doesn't get a whole lot of reactions. You know, we get we get some comments on there from other guys that do what we do, but I'm not looking to, I don't need buddies that do what we do. Yeah. We need buddies that can bring capital to then deploy into the deals yep. that we do. Um, you know, I spoke at a, a meetup group here uh, in Charleston a couple weeks ago, right off the cusp. They were like, what's your ideal investor? And I mean, it just came out. I was like, well, I, you know, my ideal investor would be people that shoot small animals for dinner. They play a lot of golf and they drink beer out of a blue can. Yeah. <laughs> and dude, the place fell apart. They were like, oh my God, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, although I don't have a lot of investors that do much of that besides beer out of a blue can and play a lot of golf. I don't have a lot of hunting buddies yeah. that invest. Yep. Yeah. What you're, doing, what you're doing, what you're talking about, for anybody listening or watching who's not catching this, you're creating authentic polarity in your marketing. You're saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I enjoy doing. By putting that out there, you're going to attract people that are interested in the same thing and repel other people, and that's a good thing. I think so many people fall into this trap of, I've got to have content that makes everybody happy or everybody's attracted to it. It's a mistake, right? I spent five years in this business tried to appeal to anybody with money and we never really grew like for the same income for three years. So I was like, what am I missing here? But the niches is where it's at. And it's uh, my business is a relationship business, like your business. And the more you get dialed into who you're speaking to, the easier it becomes to, to grow and do well. So uh, it's actually a great strategy, what you're doing. And I'm not surprised it's working for you. Good stuff, man. Yeah. All right, I'll throw you a bit of a curveball now. Cause I know you love curveballs. Sweet. Let's go. <laughs> What would you say your biggest regret is or the biggest mistake you've made with your marketing so far in real estate investing? I would say me not staying on top of the KPIs, really, key performance indicators, mm -hmm. um, you know, to see what is actually working yep. and what's not. Yep. I am terrible about that. And, yep. and my VA keeps them. Like yep. we have spreadsheets that go back years yep. <laughs> and I don't look at them ever. Yep. And I need to, yeah, we need to, we need to have a sit down once every couple of weeks probably and say, Hey, look, let's just designate an hour to the KPIs on the different things that we're doing. Yep. What's funny is uh, people every week will ask me questions about data that doesn't matter. Right. They'll, they'll focus on stuff. What should this be? And I'll just say, you know what? You want to talk to new passive investors, right? Right. Okay. Why don't you pay attention to what marketing activities are generating calls, right? From a high level, what's working, what's not. And then yeah. of those calls, who's actually investing? And then you'll start to see, even though you may have great data from this source, but it doesn't actually lead to the promise lane, is it really that valuable? So with our business, all I care about, and it's a little different business again, but it's still relationship based. So that part's the same. I say, where are my booked calls coming from? That's what I want to know. Right? Yeah. The people yeah. I'm closing, where are they coming from? So I would challenge all of right. you and watching to think about that. Sometimes we can make it a bit simpler, but the data doesn't lie. So, No, uh, and there's not a lot that have the uh, he, him, he slash him thing on their, 
on their uh, LinkedIn account that resonate with my uh, shooting small animals for dinner. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. I got you. All right. This will be very interesting coming from you. Can you share a story about your real estate investing journey that you have not shared publicly before? It could be something funny, something you learn. It could be whatever you want to. We're looking for something authentically Chuck that no one's ever heard before about this journey. It may be something from the single family days, whatever you want. There's been a couple of people that have heard this, but it's not public knowledge that um, on our first webinar that we had, we set up a uh, we set up a text message alert to go out yeah. like two hours before and then one hour before and then right when it was starting. Yeah. And that was supposed to be at uh, 5 or 6 p.m. is when it started. We clicked a.m. <laughs> so people. <laughs> yeah. So there is a big list of people. And there's even one that we all know very well who, who's an investor of ours who's, you know, I mean, has billions of dollars in assets under management. He gets a text message at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> saying, hey, <laughs> webinar is in two hours. <laughs> yeah, it was bad. And then, and then we sent another one at like four o'clock and another one like at 4.55. <laughs> it's in five minutes. And of course, I didn't realize it because I don't. I don't get those text messages. Yeah, you know, they don't come to me. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. Now I went out up? to went out to a couple hundred people. Huh? Did people did people show up? <laughs> no, nobody <laughs> showed up. I got a lot of text messages that day, man. They weren't happy, were they? I did, dude. Everybody, it, I don't. I didn't get a single text message to anybody that was pissed off. Like everybody was laughing. They were like, dude. So fun. we knew when it was. It was PM, not AM. We get it, you know. God, that's funny. I I've seen people. I've seen all kinds of stuff like that happen. I've seen people get really stressed out when there's a mistake like that. But you know what? If the mistake leads to a conversation, it can actually still be effective for you. Oh, a hundred percent. No, and it was. It was effective. Yeah, a lot of different people. Yeah, I mean, they didn't care. You know, I mean, who really gets? You know, very very few people don't have do not disturb on their yeah. phone. All. Yeah, yeah, they just wake up and they're like, oh, look there. Charlie yeah. texted me at three o'clock in the morning. That's not weird. like when we were kids and the home phone rang in the middle of the night and it woke up everybody, you know. Oh god. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. good stuff, man. And that's that was usually me butt dialing my dad while I'm at a party or something, you know. <laughs> he just, just sits there and listens to it. You know. <laughs> He's done that so many times growing up, man. It's terrifying. Sometimes you look down at your phone and you go, oh my God, this thing's been on for three minutes. And you see who it is and you're like, oh no. The worst, man, this has happened to me twice, is I think I was in the bathroom, right? In the bathroom at home. And I look yeah. down at the floor and my phone is FaceTiming somebody. And I'm like, <laughs> what? What in the world? Like, are you kidding me? And you know, you're quickly angling it away from me, but you're like trying to hang up like, what is going on? I may have done it to the same person twice before. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but that is not fun. That's not a good view, man. I'm sitting here, you know what? And that's just put a mental picture in my head too, man. Like I, I said, I saw it ringing and turned it away from me, but I'm like trying to hang <laughs> up and can't see the screen. All right. Um, if you talk to somebody new today that said, hey, man, I'm, I'm thinking about getting in the capital raising game. I'm thinking about being a real estate investor. What piece of advice from a marketing standpoint would you give that newbie? Because we see them, you and I both see them every week. New people excited to get rich in this business. Oh my right gosh, time. dude. Um, you know, put a list together. Go through your phone. I had a list of 6,000 contacts when I started. Trust me, Active Campaign doesn't appreciate that. Yeah. Um, They don't appreciate that at all. But yeah. it's you know, put a list together, kind of categorize them by friends and family, people that you have a relationship with, people that you don't know. Yeah. You'll end up deleting a lot of people. Yeah. And, uh, and then you, you got to get known, man. You know, you got to get out there. You got to get known for what you're doing now, yeah. not what you did. Yeah. Because trust me, I was, no, you know, everybody knew Charlie as 
the general contractor, not the guy that handles their retirement wealth. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, he <laughs> he can build you an office, but what are you talking about? How how's he gonna you know make me money with my retirement money? That's yeah. just weird. So it took a while to get through that, but not you know. I mean, build the list. You got to get out there. Once you have the list, you got to have something like what you offer. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. I mean, that's that's how you start. It's by the drip campaign and email. Yeah. So you got to get set up with Jason, and then you go after social media like crazy. Yeah. And then just stay on the phone talking to people. Yeah. A good thing, a theme with what I'm hearing from you on the show today is consistent effort. And so many people, oh, yeah. they're just unwilling to do it because like, it's not perfect yet. You know, in our team, yeah. if we're doing something new, uh, if it's a C minus, we're launching it. We're launching it because it's taking forward action and we'll improve it on the way. But to sit around and make anything perfect is a waste of your time. That's my experience. So It really is. Yeah. It really is. And I was being a contractor. I mean, I really wanted things perfect. For a yeah. long time, and I realized that real quick that hey, dude, let's just get it out, just go. Yeah, if you're, I mean, you're not you're like level enough, I don't want you building my house, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know it. No, because I mean that's where I came from. Yeah. I, it had to be perfect. Yep. You know. Yep. And now, you know, you know, I went from blue tape and everything to saying, "Let's go, send yep. it, let's go." Yep, I like it. All right, so we are recording this right at the end of February 2023. As you look forward for the rest of uh, 2023, what are you most focused on in your business? Systems and processes and getting out there in front of people. Yep. For so, sure. I mean, that's what it's all about, really. Yep. Absolutely. You know, because if people don't know what you do, they, they can't invest with you. Yep. Well said. Well said. If somebody listening or watching wants to learn more about you, or what you're doing, what's the best way that they can do so? Um, I, you know, Facebook, it's Cordell Capital, C-O-R-D-E-L-L, -L, Capital. Um, we have Facebook, Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn is really big with us. Uh, you can email us. Uh, Charlie, you can email me personally, charlie at cordellcapital.com. Um, or you can go to our website. CordellCapital.com. Shoot us a message. We'll uh, try to book a call. Sounds great, man. Well, I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show today. It was fun. Jason, can't wait to see you again. I think we got a Miami trip planned. What else we got this year? You, you know, I'm sure there's several different things that we're going to go hang out and have a ball at. Oh, yeah. I'm going to uh, North Carolina in June to uh, that yeah, to investment conference. Yeah. MFIN Con. Yeah, I hate to say it because it's just a terrible name. So that's why I went with the long, long version. <laughs> All right, brother. See you soon. All right, buddy. Later, pal. Thank you for listening to this episode of the show. I had a great time making it, and I hope you really enjoyed yourself listening to it. If you want to keep up with all things Real Estate Investor Marketing Stories podcast related, I encourage you strongly to go to reimarketingstories.com and signing up for our podcast newsletter. We will simply keep you up to date with what's going on with the show, new episodes, and things like that. reimarketingstories.com. So hopefully today's episode and the other episodes that you'll listen to will remind you that as a real estate investor, everybody starts at the beginning, okay? Um, our guests today and the other guests that you will hear on this show will share their real story, right? They'll tell you what worked, what didn't work. And I want you to remember one thing if you remember nothing else today. It's possible for you to, okay? Never stop going and keep following your passion. Finally, today's show has been brought to you by CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. If you're an active capital raiser, you are ready to learn the three areas that are holding you back from raising more capital, I strongly suggest you check out CapitalRaisingAutomations.com. Check out our free 10-minute video there, and you let me know if it doesn't provide you value. I'm sure it will. All right, thanks again for listening to the show this week. Hope to see you next time. Take care.